give everybody another two minutes to join us um, and start on 2 p.m. on the dot. Uh, minutes. I am on 2 p.m. on the dot, so I am going to give a warm welcome to Ken and Kay Nash. Um, today we're going to be um, on menopause um, on our chat box and join in with us, and we'll be monitoring that as well. Um, Um, Dr. Mary Atkinson is the is a director at Dahlia and the lead of Menopause Care Solutions. And Kay Nash is the founder of Dahlia. Dahlia is actually a company founded as mentioned that are suffering silently <laughs> with menopause and struggling with home and work and unable to find practical solutions to support themselves. Um, they started out with a powerful goal to learn what South African women in various stages of they supported by evidence led information and hours of coaching um, and have built together a, a base of information available on their website. Um, and I'm so grateful to be joined by both um, Dr. At Mary Atkinson and Kay. Um, ladies, welcome. Thank you. And thank you for joining me this morning, afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> it's such a pleasure. <laughs> I want to just, I want to, I want to kick off. By asking... Daniela, just to say, just as we start, um, there seems to be a problem with your audio. So you seem to well, just awesome. hang every now and then. So as you start to talk, we don't, you, you have these glitches. So I'm not sure if you want to just check from your end um, what's happening, but we don't kind of hear yeah, the full sentence up. and you, you sort of are coming in and out. Like you're hanging at the moment. <laughs> not literally. Can you, can you hear me yet? Um, yeah, so it's, it's not an issue with necessarily with audio, but it's every time you just start to talk, then your screen pauses and we don't hear you. And I think it's shared. There are a couple of comments in the chat that people are hearing, are having difficulty in terms of that. Maybe somebody in the chat can just say if they seem to be having the same issue with me. But okay, I think, I think what I'm going to do case. is turn my camera off Mary, yours is fine. Okay. Uh, 
Have we lost that it all together? Right. Yeah, so the am I still with chat? Thanks. It's just it just seems to be Daniela. Am I back? Right. <laughs> you are back. It seems that oh. the issue was only on your side, and with Kay and I, um, it seems to be yeah. audio fine. Okay. We probably, I can we probably need perfect. to go back onto presentation mode as well, Daniela. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, okay, am I, can you hear me fine and, and see me fine now? Yes, seems much better. Okay, oh, marvellous. Jeez, talk about a stressor to kick off a webinar. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off by asking you your why. Um, Mary, why why, web, why menopause? Why, why do you eat, sleep, and breathe menopause? What is your passion behind it? What, what draws you to it? So I eat, sleep, and breathe it because I'm currently I'm going through the menopause transition, <laughs> so to put it plainly. But um, I think the the real reason for me is is when I started going through the menopause transition, um, I wasn't in this field, and despite actually seeing a number of my colleagues, um, it was never really identified as the menopause transition. I was early in the, the perimenopausal journey. So as we'll go through in a moment, how we detect those different phases, it's often not well recognized in terms of a, the conglomeration of symptoms. And so, I, you know, from a, from a vagueness of symptoms perspective, I was, I was an MD in a, in a position and my, my main sort of symptom was fatigue and it was kind of written off as well that's in keeping with the, you know what you're doing and the travel and the late nights and the stress of the job and all the rest of it and so it kind of went in keeping with maybe every now and again a little bit more anxiety and for me you know presenting for example was just something that is part of your day job and something that you just do but all of a sudden I'd, I'd feel these amazing waves of anxiety when I'd need to be presenting which was so like not in keeping um, with, with who I was. And, and then I'd have the occasional sleepless night. And it was all these sort of, honestly, things that can be just written off as life and vague and all the rest of it. And But when you start to put them all together and you start to go, well, there is actually a little bit more um, joint pain and there is a little bit more, uh, you know, less um, endurance during sport and all those kinds of things, and you start to see one after the next after the next symptom, you realize it's menopause. So um, certainly when I met Kay, and you'll hear her story just now, um, it resonated that we, for both of us, it kind of, despite being in the field and knowing so much, you still kind of miss it. Um, and and so I just, we, we, we really don't want any other woman to be struggling through the same thing when there are very good um, solutions to it. Yeah, geez, that's, that touches home for me. Um, woman very close to me is also going through it. And there's so, so many elements to it than just, I think what the society assumes is um, it, it impacts and touches so many parts of your life that you think wouldn't. Um, so I think it's, this is the kind of conversation I think it's needed to have. And thank you so much for having it and sharing what you're passionate about. Um, if I can add to that as well, just from something that you've said in terms of, of um, you know, when you watch people going through it. So the other part in our story is that um, my mum is now well into her 80s and she um, was diagnosed with Alzheimer's a couple of years ago. And for me, it was this whole journey of making sure that I do whatever I can do in terms of from a health journey now, which is why I, I did a fellowship in, in functional medicine just in terms of what can you do to live healthier and be healthier so that you're able to, to prevent whatever you can do in the long term. And there's no doubt that the hormonal journey is part of that. And when I think back, she was part of the whole issue that happened after the World's Health, uh, the Women's Health Initiative, which we will go through just now, where this whole sort of myth surrounded HRT in terms of, oh, no, don't do HRT, it's dangerous, it has side effects, it causes breast cancer. And so she was, I remember her being on Premarin and she was swiftly taken off that and her life just, you know, I remember her just from a mood perspective wasn't great. And from then sort of things seemed to derail 
Um, and so the other side to, to what we do um, in Dahlia is to myth bust and make sure that, you know, people know the facts and that you can make really well informed decisions in terms of your health and in terms of your future health and what you want to do. 100%. Let's maybe touch on some of those facts. I'm going to ask you so a couple of questions. I know that there's a bit of a disclaimer you want to make in, in answering it, but I was wondering if you could just tell me, what, you know, what is this menopause thing? Does it only affect women? Um, how do you know when it starts? What are its impacts? Um, those sort of, give us a little bit of guidance on that. Great. So I think that just if you'll just click to my disclaimer slide, um, just in terms of that I have no financial disclosures. Um, and also, as this is a webinar, to everybody, um, please, uh, whatever I say is not does not constitute individual medical advice. It is all obviously fact-driven and evidence-led, but I would prefer that you consult with your healthcare pr practitioner in terms of implementation or changing of anything that you may be on or are going through. But maybe if we can go to the slide that is on, so let's click to the next one, because I think we've if we've kind of been through that, we, we can come back to it. But I think when I'm sitting with my patients, always the first thing that I get asked is, you know, what is menopause? How do we diagnose it? How do I know I've got it? Um, could I be in it? Um, and, and the most thing is, is, well, I'm still getting my period. So does that mean that I'm not in menopause? Because traditionally, if you look at the definition of, of, of menopause, it's when your last period was a year ago. But by the time you get to your last period being a year ago, like a lot of water has gone under the bridge, like you are way into the majority of your symptoms and usually have been for years. So what we know now is that perimenopause, which is the time period before the absolute sort of culmination of the ending of your period, can be anything from five to 10 years. And during that time, if you look at this um, slide, so um, which is so helpful is you'll see that during the normal sort of reproductive years, the two, and testosterone as a hormone is not in this picture, but the two dominant hormones from a sex hormone perspective are progesterone and estrogen. And those are in a lovely balance and they have, they tend to have a, a rhythm about them during the month that determines your ovulation and your menstrual cycle. And then in the perimenopausal time, all of this starts to kind of go wrong. So the ovaries are still making some hormone, but not consistently, not even consistently month to month that can change. And so that's also the confusing part is women will come in and they'll go, you know, when I filled in the form to see you, like I was feeling terrible and I was getting flashes already and it was really awful. And now I'm absolutely fine. So I don't know. I think I'm going crazy. So it's like, and that's the point is that in the perimenopause, the hormones are actually in flux all the time. And particularly when we look at it as a general picture, the first hormone that tends to be going is progesterone. And the one that is more dominant during this time is estrogen. And so that's why the symptoms can also be very different in perimenopause versus when we get to full-blown menopause where all hormones are completely gone. So in this phase where it's more progesterone that is gone, that's when we start to see the lack of sleep or your sleep pattern changes. Sleep's just not as deep as it used to be. I tend to be more anxious. One of the, the sort of what we call weird symptoms of, of menopause or abnormal symptoms of menopause, but actually the more I speak to ladies, it seems to be a quite common a symptom of menopause <laughs> is driving anxiety. So all of a sudden where you used to be absolutely fine as a passenger in the car, you like really freaking out or, you know, driving at night, sort of any of those sort of more vulnerable times definitely becomes a more anxious moment. Um, and that's obviously where some of the other symptoms start to, to come in. But it is definitely from a mood component, we see a lot more mood derangement starting to happen in perimenopause. And especially in women who have experienced postpartum depression, they're more at risk of mood disorders during the perimenopausal time. And for many women, this can start in their late 30s or early 40s. So it's really important to know because we're seeing that as a time when we're at top of our game and usually women are, they're balancing everything from sort of young kids or teenage kids to looking after parents. And they're sort of, you know, just reaching that managerial aspect of their job. And like all of a sudden, all of these symptoms are starting. 
And as I say, that initial phase in terms of perimenopause is often more the anxiety, more of those things. And as we approach menopause, where you truly start seeing huge changes in the cycle, initially there can be a heavier cycle, um, and then eventually, obviously, irregular cycles and eventually the cycle finishing. But by that stage, lots of symptomatology. So if you want to just click to the next slide in terms of what those symptoms are, and again, as I say, dependent on which hormones are dominant and what's happening with them, these can change. And they can also change at different times in the month, depending on what the ovaries are still doing. So it can start more with mood. Definitely by the time estrogen is a key component and is more on the lower side than the upper side, then we start to see hot flashes, night sweats. And that's normally sort of seen as the hallmark of the menopause symptom. But I think it's also really important to know that 30% of women don't experience hot flashes and night sweats. So they don't get that at all. So then they're going through menopause and there are maybe other symptoms. So, for example, their mood has got worse. Um, they are not sleeping. Um, they're experiencing, you know, loss of libido. Um, they experience more muscle and joint pains. But there's no hot flashes. So they don't think that that's an issue. Um, wow. And it's important to know that, that actually you can have menopause and go through the whole transition without the hot flashes. So, yeah, okay. symptoms do change during this time, and they certainly do change dependent on which hormone is 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 on the scene or not at the time. Yes, that explains so much. I mean, in the conversations I've had with ladies um, in my life that have gone through menopause, you know, some have said, oh, it was a breeze. Nothing happened to me. It was, it was totally fine. And then others are, are naming the um, temperature surges that they get. Um, a very close lady to me names her Sergio Sergio and would be sitting around a lunch table and she says, oh, yes, Sergio again, because, you know, to try and cope with the the influx of those 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 heat surges. So it's interesting to see how different women go through these things. Yeah, I and I think, to- I think it's exactly to that and it's how it impacts her life, right? So um, I was I was recently at a at a leadership conference and the one lady was saying that she um, worked with somebody who was going through menopause and she would just have this kind of off button kind of signal where she would just want her colleague to take over for her because if she was going up onto stage and she was going to do a presentation and all of a sudden she went she had a hot flush or everybody else in the audience it would suddenly look like she was incredibly anxious and nervous and all the rest of it and you know that in the presentation context that's not great because you actually want people to think that you're confident and now yeah she's having a hot flush quite apart from the fact that having a hot flush is a really vulnerable feeling and so you don't feel great you really feel like something is desperately wrong with you um and and so you know in the context of going through it on its own but then how it impacts your life is also very different and then for other patients who, in terms of how symptoms vary, you know, where heavy bleeding was was actually the, the, the issue more in the perimenopausal time. And she had to time her life around when she knew her period would come because she knew she had about an hour max before she would need to be changing her everything um, in terms of clothes and, and all the rest of it. So she, she had an hour. And so in that hour, she needed to get out, do some chores and get back in so that she could change and do whatever. And that's debilitating um, yeah. in terms of, of what you go through. So these are real life changes with real impact in terms of, of what happens. There's a question in the chat box about the loss of libido. And it is 100%. It is a major issue. And there are so many libido in... Is in, in women especially is such a multifactorial um, issue in that it is the, the mood component of menopause is key because you just, there's this whole loss of joy of la- and loss of the sort of normal sort of vigor for life, loss of the things you, you really used to bring you, you just simple joy. There's this anxiety component. And so you, you're nervous about, about life in general, about yourself. There's the change in your body. And so generally, um, you know, most women going through menopause, menopause is known as a weight gain time. So the average weight gain during menopause is 10 kilograms. And so the body is changing quite apart from the actual sexual changes around um, menopause with the loss of, of the sex hormones. The testosterone, as I mentioned, um, it was not in that original slide, is usually one of the first hormones that also declines. And um, it's, it's major in terms of, of libido. Um, the latest consensus guidelines have just been, well, 
in fact, the first consensus guidelines have just been written on testosterone. And the key agreement is that is its impact in terms of libido and, and um, sexual health disorders. So, you know, there are also changes that are happening from a genitourinary symptom perspective in terms of changes in the vagina, et cetera, where loss of arousal, loss of sensation, all the rest of it. So all of these changes are happening at the same time. And ultimately, it's kind of termed libido. But it's, it sure. really needs to be assessed individually so that we can see how we, we resolve those, you know. And then if you go to the next slide, there are also changes um, – Interculturally, um, ethnicity-wise, um, we know that that um, in terms of different ethnicities, this is um, there's, there's a good US UK-based research. In fact, there's research um, from the US as well, certainly borne out by the research that we did in South Africa um, amongst women, showing that there are definitely different nuances in terms of not just how we experience, but when we experience menopause. So um, with our black and Indian um, ladies certainly going through menopause earlier um, and often with a higher incidence of hot flushes and also with them lasting longer. So the symptoms of menopause on average last seven years, but um, can actually last for us up to sort of 15 years. So um, this is not something that we just want to white knuckle it through and just because it'll last sort of six months and then it'll be over. Um, for most people, it is years. Sure. And does it does it um, only impact women, all these symptoms and, and, and stats? Is it only women that get menopause? So in terms of the definition of menopause, which obviously is around our menstrual cycle and all of those hormones, yes, women um, experience menopause. But if you're meaning, you know, do men go through a similar hormonal change? Um, obviously, in terms of the male context, they also have estrogen, testosterone and progesterone, but they have them in different ratios. And for sure, um, andropause um, is a very well recognized condition in men. Um, which also starts to impact them. You know, if you look at how testosterone specifically declines in men over their lifetime, the key thing there is that for them it is a much more gradual decline, whereas with women you have this kind of six-monthly done, gone. Um, you know, and it's like from one minute to the next there's estrogen, then there's not, none. And so then there's this huge onset of symptoms, but absolutely men go through andropause. Sure. I can't imagine the psychosocial impacts of all these changes in your body, all these changes in your primary relationship, and then all these difficult chemical imbalances, or I don't want to call them imbalances, but changes within potentially both you and your partner going on. Um, I mean, this must have massive impacts on psychosocial health as well. For sure. I mean, you know, I think that, that the key thing is what I tend to see in women going through menopause is this deep introspection time of life and the change. And especially for women where there is this huge impact on libido and all the rest of that can cause interrelationship issues. If she does have the genitourinary syndrome of menopause where there's vaginal dryness and now pain on intercourse and all the rest of it, then she doesn't want to be intimate because it's painful. And it's so there are all of those aspects in terms of the relationship. At work, obviously, she's not sleeping, there's the brain fog, there's this concern that I'm going to have a flush in the middle of a business meeting, there's, you know, there's the anxiety side, there's just this sort of, I'm not coping feeling, which obviously has a major impact on her in society, in her job, in her role, and just trying to, to sort of do life. And waking up in the morning is, is tough, you know, the, most of the um, most of the, the ladies that I, that I see, they, they're literally dragging themselves through the day. Um, and um, when the symptoms are, are, are there and they, and they are having a symptomatic menopause, it can really be debilitating. Yeah. What, uh, speaking of symptoms, what, what are some of the risks involved? Uh, so, so, yeah, I think yeah. that's, a great, um, that's a great question. And I, I'm a, I put together this slide simply because the um, cardiovascular um, focus is really on world menopause um, is the cardiovascular risks around menopause because often I think you know we 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 speak about menopause if you a woman who gets to the age of 50 51 the chances are you will experience menopause and every woman getting to beyond 50 will experience menopause 
And because it's seen as a natural process, the question is often, well, should we do anything about it? Is there a problem with it? You know, is there increased risk associated? Um, and what we know for sure is that there are physiological changes associated with the decreasing hormone levels, whether we want to call it a decline or a deprivation of hormones or whatever. Um, hormones are fundamentally anti-inflammatory. Um, they are life-giving. They are absolutely amazing things for our body. And certainly we start to see changes in terms of increased cardiovascular risk in women. We see bone changes. We see in the first year, um, you know, loss of 10% of bone mass. We start to see changes in the brain. Um, and so that's where um, we know that there are certainly physiological changes that happen, which increase our risk. So it is now pretty much um, accepted that there's no doubt that there's a cardiovascular risk change in the premenopausal woman versus the postmenopausal woman. And in fact, if you go to the next slide, I just I have the, the, the figure there, which is quite startling. So cardiovascular disease is the num number one killer of, uh, amongst both men and women. And in women, it's always seen as, you know, we always kind of like, whenever you think of a heart attack, you kind of think of a man clutching his chest going, oh my gosh, you know, and you just know it's a heart attack. The first thing is, is in women, these symptoms are very different. Usually, um, the, there isn't that classical sign of clutching your chest. It's more of what actually looks like a panic attack. It's more of, you know, um, just an uncomfortable feeling sometimes. It's more of heartburn sometimes, those kinds of things. So, but we also underestimate it because I know certainly when I was at, at, at Varsity, um, we, just, we just knew that men were at a higher risk of heart disease than women. Um, now we know that up until the age of, up until menopause, essentially, so up until the age of 50, yes, um, the, the women are at a lower risk of heart disease than men. But once we go through menopause, we have a higher risk of heart disease than men. And I don't think that that is, is a well-known um, statistic. I don't think it's well understood. And the little graph on the side is just the alarming rate of increase of, of heart attacks, essentially, in women post-menopause versus pre-menopause. And I love to just put in sometimes a picture because a picture says a thousand words. Even if you don't understand it in terms of some of the minutia, it just really helps to, to sort of paint that picture. And that, you know, that previous slide, I mean, it, it would take probably an entire two webinars to go through the exact physiological <laughs> changes. And I don't think that that's necessary. But I think that it, what's really important is that it is well documented in terms of what the changes are that start to happen in the cardiovascular system in the perimenopause through the menopause time. And that's where the concept of when we becoming, when we start thinking about how do we treat this, do we treat this? Um, when is this window of opportunity? So if you are on social media, you'll start seeing that so many people are talking about the window of opportunity in terms of when we should start treatment for, for menopause. And that generally is in the perimenopausal early menopause years, because that's already when we start to see these cardiovascular risk changes set in. Um, I okay. haven't put in slides specific to bone disease and dementia, etc. But anything that affects us cardiovascularly, which is affecting blood vessels, is then affecting the rest of our body. Naturally, right. sure. Could I, I just wanna... quickly interject, ladies? I think yes. just to say to everyone in the chat room um, that we will get back to everybody whose questions we don't answer after the session. So they must they must just be comfortable that we will get back to them. Okay, you interjected at the perfect spot. You were next in the firing line. <laughs> oh, no, oh, no. Oh, okay, I wanted to ask you, and before I do, I'm going to put up a slide for everybody to take part in our little poll. We want to find out from you, have you experienced menopause in any way? So do you have it? Have you been through it? Do you currently live with someone going through it? Or hasn't it, hasn't it impacted or have, haven't you experienced it at all? Um. Okay, I want to ask you, um, firstly, why do you eat, sleep, and breathe <laughs> menopause as well? Because I don't have a darn option. Um, <laughs> um, no, I think very, very similarly to Mary, um, I am 59. My children range from 17 to 33. Uh, and I've spent my whole life being way too busy to pay attention to my health. Um and at no stage along my journey did I ever hear about menopause. So in my early 40s, 
I mean, it was really, I thought I was on top of my game and I was running and fixing businesses. And I became really anxious. I was really tired. I couldn't sleep at night. Really, things that I kept describing as weird. Um, I thought I was losing my mind. I had brain fog. I could look at someone in a meeting and go, um, and I couldn't, I couldn't remember. I'd lose my thread. I'd be standing looking at a board and presenting and I couldn't remember. And I was like, this is it. I am completely going mad. I've lost my mind. I'm going to lose my job. Um, and I went and saw GPs, gynees, cardiologists. I mean, I had chest pains. I was anxious. Psychiatrists. I saw everyone. And so my, my life through my forties, uh, and it started in my early forties was very expensive actually and I learned a whole lot of stuff but a lot of the stuff that I learned wasn't necessarily uh, providing me with any solutions and it's jolly jolly expensive anyway so what I did was the more anxious and worried I became about what on earth I was was going through the more quiet I got I got really I mean you know I just suffered silently because I was very worried that I was going to lose my job that my husband, who's 10 years younger than me, uh, was going to find out that I was an old bag. He knew I was an old bag, but he thought I was a younger bag. Um, <laughs> I just had a child in my early 40s. So I really thought I was on my game. I was really very, you know, gorgeous and having babies and kind of. So this was very scary. And I went deeply silent. And I think this is what we all discover about menopause is that the biggest problem is because of those stigmas, you just dive into a deep silent hole and I think it was it, you know had I known I ended up leaving that job um, I ended up you know not finding a solution which made me question myself which is terrible we'll all know you know you start to lose your confidence there is it's a great crime against mankind um, and eventually I saw a woman's wellness doctor and she said to me yeah for an intelligent woman I was in those days um, you know you're bloody stupid you're in menopause and and slowly that tr that changed my life because I started to read, I learned, uh, I started to find solutions across the board, natural solutions, uh, medical solutions. And I actually discovered that I didn't need to be, you know, having such a really terrifically bad journey. So my story, as we found in our 1,500 stories we heard from women when we did this research in South Africa, is that it's such a familiar story. Um, and a lot of women are leaving their jobs at that critical time for businesses. Um, you know, women of African descent are four or five years earlier. You know, trans it affects transformation. It affects gender equality. And so I got on a horse, and this is where we are. Um, I, we feel very strongly about spreading the word and unmuting menopause. And it was, yeah, thank goodness I, <laughs> it came out the other side. It's still it's menopause is a journey and it, it you know it doesn't really end when you get into your late 50s like I am at 59 it just evolves and how your body copes and how your hormones operate you, you just need some more support oh it's interesting thank you so much for sharing okay I appreciate that it's brave and bold I just remember it was recording <laughs> Can I can I ask um, in terms of I've just had the opportunity while while Kay was sharing to read through some of the questions in the chat, um, and I think it might um, sort of take us into the next session in terms of so what do we do about it? But potentially, um, you know, not necessarily to answer where it's individual, but but to to make comment to some of the things in the chat um, around uh, around. So we don't don't miss those. Certainly. Um, there's one question around um, hormone therapy, and you know, if you think that you've been through menopause, should you stop hormone therapy? And just to answer that directly is that um, it used to be said that you know when you get to 60 or 65 that you should stop hormone therapy, but actually, if you look at probably what would be considered the most conservative um, guidelines in the world is the North American Menopause Society. And even there, they've changed their guidelines to say that um, there is no recommendation to stop hormones. You don't need to stop them ever. Um, they, you just need to reassess with your doctor in terms of whether they still remain appropriate. 
Um, and obviously the gold standard in terms of the therapy is would be transdermal hormones in terms of estrogen and testosterone. So just to ensure that you're on the, the safest options. Um, and so that, but no, there would be no, there would be no need to, to stop them. Thanks so um, much. Maybe, maybe we could touch on some treatments from there. <laughs> Yeah. So I think, yeah, I, I think first of all, if I, if I do take a step back then, um, the, if you want to go to the next slide around, um, kind of where all, if you look at all the guidelines from around the world, um, on, on how do we, what do we do then, you know, um, should we be doing something? Um, what if I've got no symptoms? Do I still need to treat my menopause as such? And I think the most important thing is if, when you say you've got no symptoms, just make sure that you, you are, Fully assessing what is a menopausal symptom because most people actually have symptoms. Um, hormone therapy remains the most effective treatment for menopausal symptoms. It is always and always needs to be an individualized approach in terms of what your outcomes, what you're wanting, where you are in your life, what you're hoping to achieve, where your health is at. Um, and you should be informed by your healthcare practitioner in terms of the risks and benefits of HRT and which ones and what the nuances are and what the pros and cons are. Um, and across the board, the majority of guidelines agree that the benefits of HRT far outweigh any risks and the risks that are spoken about are very much associated with some of the older forms of HRT and in some cases are just pure myth which I will show you um, in a moment. Um, and to the question that was asked, there is no minimum or maximum length of time in terms of taking HRT. There's no reason to stop them. It just does need ongoing assessment and ongoing journey with your healthcare practitioner. And there's another question around, does lifestyle matter? Lifestyle always matters both in terms of the transition through and the impact on symptoms, but also in terms of your future health. Um, and right at the end, I'll show you a slide of cancer because that's always a question I get asked in relation to HRT is, well, what about breast cancer? Is it going to cause breast cancer? And I'll show you a slide specific to that. In fact, um, I know that it's jumping a little bit, but Daniel, Daniela, maybe go to that slide. I think it's slide number 13. Um, yeah, this one. So... This is a, a slide that was put together by the, um, an organization called the Women's Health Concern, which is in the UK, based on um, NICE guidelines, um, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence guidelines. And what they've done here is they've taken the number of cases per thousand women that would get breast cancer, um, which you see as their top line. So 23 cases of breast cancer are diagnosed in the UK population per thousand women every year. And what they've done is they've then said, well, how many additional or less cases would you get based on what you did? And I'm going to start with HRT there. You'll see the two that are related to HRT. The very second line says that there would be an additional four cases if you used a combined hormone replacement therapy. And I'm going to make it very clear here that that is if you use a combined hormone therapy that includes um, an old synthetic progesterone because that data is taken from the Women's Health Initiative. And in that case, they used a synthetic progestin. It is not related to the estrogens. And in that case, um, obviously now we mitigate that risk by using natural progesterone. So most women would know Eutrogestan if they're on hormone therapy. That is a natural micronized progesterone. It is not associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. So then we can look at that next line that says how many fewer cases, and you'll see that, that there are four fewer cases of breast cancer on women on hormone therapy using, um, in that case, it was Premarin, but um, is basically estrogens. Um, that's similar, by the way, increased risk of breast cancer you see with the hormone, the combined oral contraceptive pill, which nobody even thinks about <laughs> when they go onto the pill, um, sometimes at the tender age of teenage years. Um, but you also see that the risk would be higher, even if that were the case with HRT, your risk is higher if you have two or more units of alcohol per day. 
which is where the lifestyle aspect comes in, right? So if you smoke, if you drink, if you're overweight, you can see the significantly increased risk to breast cancer incidence versus anything else, you know, that you'd be needing to be worried about. But what you see is the very last plan, which I think is so empowering because if you're on a, an estrogen with a natural micronized progesterone and you are exercising, which is the very last line, you are reducing your risk of breast cancer. And so I think that's empowering because it's what we can do now and the decisions we make now in terms of our future health. And so to the questions that have been asked around lifestyle, yes, lifestyle always matters. And so irrespective of the choice of how you choose to manage your menopause, lifestyle matters. So, yeah, I think we can go back to those guidelines. Um, the most effective treatment for um, menopausal symptoms is hormone replacement therapy. Um, and there are various forms of HRT. The gold standard, if you look around the world, um, is definitely agreed to be um, transdermal estrogen testosterone, meaning that you use either a cream, a gel, a patch, something like that, that you absorb the estrogen across the skin. The reason for that is that if you jump to slide number 12, um, which is the results, the next one, which is the results from the Women's Health Initiative, which is probably the study that we have the longest follow-up data for. This is more than 20 years. This is actually the 22-year follow-up data. You see there that actually the top graph is when you're on estrogen alone. So this is for women who do not have a uterus that had a hysterectomy. The bottom one is when they're on a synthetic progesterone or progestin with the, um, at that stage was called Premarin, the, um, what other people call, call horse urine estrogen, but I mean, it is a combined um, equine estrogen. So on the top one, you see that the, the risks associated were an increased risk of clotting, which then leads to an increased risk of pulmonary embolus. And on the bottom one, you see that there's an increased risk of clotting, which is further exacerbated by the progestin and therefore increases the risk of stroke, but also this, this marginal increase in the risk of breast cancer. Now, I could go into where there's this misrepresentation of data and all the rest of it, and so actually that increased risk of breast cancer is debatable, but even if we leave it as, as it stands, um, we no longer use medroxy progesterone acetate as the progesterone. Um, and that's why micronized, oral micronized progesterone is seen as, as gold standard, which is otherwise commercially known as Eutrogestan. Not sure if I'm allowed to say that, but anyway, I did. Um, <laughs> in the top one um, is estrogen alone. And so what you can actually see is all these blue graphs are a reduction in the risk. So you see a reduction in all cause mortality. So the risk of dying from anything, reduction in the risk of, of development of diabetes, reduction in the risk of heart disease, colorectal cancer, breast cancer. And so what we can see from this is that um, this is very long-term follow-up data showing that um, hormone therapy doesn't just help you in terms of, is the most effective treatment in terms of treating symptoms of menopause, but is actually benefiting your long-term health as well. Um, as for what we sure. said around lifestyle, lifestyle intervention, ensuring that your sort of core health measures are there is always important and even more important as we get older. And particularly as we get older, exercise, stability exercises, ensuring that we can still move and sustaining our muscle mass, all the rest of it is really important. But um, overall, um, I think that one of the things that Ken and I often speak about is the, the, the biggest myth to bust is really around hormone therapy because for years it was seen as like the absolute, you know, don't go there, don't do it, it causes so many harms. And I think it's it's a, a, one of the biggest travesties in terms of women's health um, because um, we it, it is one of the things that, as you see from this, in terms of the outcomes data, the benefits far outweigh any of the potential risks. Um, and so both in terms of helping women transition this time, but also in terms of her future health, um, it plays a huge role in management.
obviously there are some women who who then either choose not to do HRT or who, for one reason or the other, there is a contraindication. And there are other therapies. So there we look more to the specific symptoms that she's experiencing and then treat those specifically with other medicines, whether they be antidepressants or some other, you know, um, neuromodulators or whatever. Um, so there are other therapies. And obviously the one thing is, is that in terms of the systemic hormone therapy, so things that, we, that affect your whole body, but then there is also local hormone therapy um, for women who are experiencing quite severe symptoms in terms of genitourinary syndrome of menopause. I'm going to stop because I feel like I uh, may <laughs> questions. <laughs> Thank you so, 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 so much. Um, I'm most, most, most shocked about the um, woman taking the tablets, now, contraceptive tablets, and how they increase um risk lays within taking those contraceptive tablets. I think so many moms around um, give their kids those tablets or go to the doctor and doctors diagnose those tablets for skin and a whole bunch of other things, not considering the fact that there's so many outlying other things that it could be impacting. Um, on top of that, um, I want to know from you as well, some of the other um, Myths and facts. That, so I want to know if you've got any more myths and facts that you're wanting to bust outside of the ones that you've just listed now, or you'd be happy for us to go on to the role of line managers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, whichever way you want to you want to um, do it. I mean, there's so much we could obviously be here for six hours, but so yeah, go for it in terms of. Okay. I, mean, I, I just, I think, I just think on the myths front, you know, and when you look at it culturally and there are there are myths around HRT. There are also the the general mythology around you know you, you no longer can reproduce, therefore you are a Google. You know that's it. Um, and I think those myths around you know ageism at work. Well, you're old and you can't remember anything, and so you know we we need to actually start looking beyond you for this leadership position. Those types of myths that are incredibly destructive. Um, and the more silent we all keep, ladies and men and everybody's, um, the more prevalent these myths are allowed to remain in society. And it stops you getting help. Help, You know, you just don't talk about it. You don't talk about it at work. That means you don't get the right support. Um, and on and on and on. It means that your partner, in my case, I've converted him into a husband, you know, he just thought I was going completely batshit crazy. So it is it is really important that we bust the myth that we don't keep quiet about this and we start compassionate and kind conversations with each other and with people at work and people at home. Bust those myths. <laughs> Break the stigma. <laughs> yes, exactly. I wonder if you could, Kay, speaking on the line of role managers and managers in general, um, within a corporate setting, what sort yeah. of role could they play? Or what sort of knowledge could they use in creating confidence and setting up a comfortable working environment around this topic? Okay, if you pop to the next slide for me, I think just as I'm talking, take a read of this and you realize how prevalent these issues are at work. And our, you know, we know our line managers are the heartbeat of a business we've all been there we work with them every day they drive everything from you know performance to personal support and line managers it is absolutely critical when you look at these stats how prevalent this is 85 percent of working women want active menopause support at work they're hiding their symptoms two in five of them so we need our line managers to learn about menopause they really need knowledge so if you go to the next slide what we say to companies and to people in business is, you know, it starts with creating awareness. So the line manager needs to learn and 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 spend time understanding. Um, and that's an important part of the process. And then starting the conversation. You know, you don't it's not particularly difficult to kind of understand where women are in their age and their life stage, and then to be able to be, if you're well versed with menopause, to be able to start having that type of conversation. We find line managers should have events. They don't need to be big formal events. Just get people are in a room, have a cup of tea and talk about, or coffee, much better, um, menopause. You know, So have those events, um, simple toolkits. 
you know, because people love to know, but once they know about menopause and they're starting to learn, they want to go, what can I do? What should I do? So, you know, simple, simple toolkits that the line managers can have. I mean, the gold standard of anything is getting menopause policy into companies. Um, when you think about the number of women who are leaving, the stats are absolutely, um, it's very salutary how many women just quietly leave the stage. Um, and that's really sad. And I think menopause policies would help with that. Training co-workers. Training is really important. We all know how important training is. Um, and once your line managers are, are, are well versed, um, we can train our co-workers. HR professionals, critical to all of this. Um, and so I think going back to the role of the line manager, it's to start really by learning, being aware, and starting to have a conversation. I mean, the first conversation you always have is a difficult one. But I started to do this in business and you know, we had men and women in the meeting and it was just a meeting where it felt like I could have a bit of a personal conversation and nobody really said anything. But the the, the comeback after that, uh, when people started to say, gosh, that was interesting. Can you tell me some more? What can I do? Uh, and as a line manager, it opened up a, an entire, it was like a story virus and everybody became involved. And then, and, and, the, and the feedback is always, it's life changing. You know, just being able to, have the conversation. No, I'm not going crazy. Role, you know, the role of the line manager is to get the most out of their people and to let them perform at their absolute best and support them. And this is, you've got to do this because as Michelle Obama said, it's only half of us, <laughs> but it's a lot. Half of everybody at work, I hope soon will be women. Um, and, and, you know, women who, you know, people who identify as women. And I think this is Light role man, the land manager. I want to have them all in a room one day, millions of them, because I think they are a big part of the game changing. Hundred percent. I, th I love the idea of nominating champions and advocates for the topic and, and creating space for the conversation and accountability yeah. within someone's world to have the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I think most companies have actually set up. You know, somebody's responsible for diversity and inclusion. Somebody's responsible for this, for that, for that. So. I encourage if you're on this call and, and you form part of a, a team that makes that kind of call to nominate a champion to speak about menopause. <laughs> Start the conversation. Brilliant. Start the conversation. Yeah. I think the important thing there is, um, you know, I think there's always this concern that if I'm going to say I'm going through menopause or if I'm going to, then there's going to be, I'm going to be stigmatized in a certain way. I'm going to be seen to be, a, you know, but the important thing as well is that the most people just want to be heard and they want to know that it's, it's okay. Yeah. This is, and the other thing is menopause really can be managed. We really can feel vibrant again and you can really feel great. And so when people know how to access the right support and the right care, um, they can really feel good, but there is a transition and it is a journey. Um, what I know in terms of hormone therapy is it's not like taking a panada for a headache that you feel the change within a few minutes or hours, you know. Um, it can take months until you fully are at your vibrant self again. And it's really important during that time to know that there's at least a safe space where if you're having a bad day or there's something like that, you can you can kind of raise your hand and say, listen, it's just one of those days. Um I think a lot of people are nervous that it's, is this going to be like used as an, as an excuse? I know that there's, there's recently that, I don't know if anybody's seen it on social media, a woman in the UK who actually got paid out because um, her, her um, line manager told her she uses menopause as an excuse for everything. But the, oh the point is, that, you know, so the, and so she's made it her mission to say, well, actually, when you're going through it, it's like you really, you, you, you can't see it, you know, it, it does affect everything. And so, it's, it is important to, to just know that at least somebody is seeing that um, and to be able to talk about it. 100%. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to end off there um, in saying if anything within this webinar has, has triggered you in any way um, and you wanted to speak to somebody on an individual basis for professional support from a psychosocial perspective, um, please feel free to contact Ask Nelson. Um, the webinar is brought to you by Kyelo and uh, Kyelo Lifestyle Ask Nelson. Um, and, and then to extend my thanks to 
to both Dr. Mary Atkinson and Kay Nash. Uh, I am so grateful for both of you and so grateful that you are changing the way that women think and speak and not just women, in fact, men and organizations speak about this kind of thing. Um, if anybody on the call does want to um, extend the conversation within the organization, um, please do contact your account manager um, to set up some time and we can have this conversation even further. If you'd be so kind to rate the session, let us know how you found it. Um, in the last couple of minutes, I see we've got another five minutes. I'm going to open the floor if um, you ladies are okay with it to see if anybody wants to ask a question. Happy. All right. I have allowed the option to speak. If you do want to ask a question and you are brave enough to ask a question, please click the speak button and we will um, let you through. I'm seeing a few speaks. You see, seeing a few speaks. I see Muriel has her hand up to speak. There you go. Why is it not letting me allow you? I don't have any requests to speak. Can you accept it from your side, um, Kay, by any chance? Um, why, are you, why are you finding that? I'll answer the one um, that came there through in the go. chat, which was, is there any way of predicting, you know, based on when you started your period in the beginning and it, based on that is there any way of knowing when you're going to be going through perimenopause no and there's also which is the short answer i'm afraid and there's also no way of knowing how long the perimenopause is going to be so it's it literally can be you know anywhere from a year to to 10 years quite honestly so we really don't know um, and that's where thankfully there is a lot more research happening um, to clarify these questions going forward. So the one good thing about menopause being so topical at the moment is that there is definitely, um, it's put it on the map in terms of knowing that we need a lot more um, guidance research to be done. Okay. Mary, there I was also an interesting either. note on um, PMBs and medical aids and, and just saying, you know, there is some coverage on medical aids on this on minimum benefits, just in case people want to know. Great. Was that a statement or, just, or a question? Sorry. It was, it was a statement, but I, I wondered if it was worth, you know, if it was worth commenting on or adding to, but I think it's just worth people knowing. Yeah. I think it does vary um, in terms of the coverage um, and which options, um, you know, from a, from a treatment perspective get covered. Um, yeah. But for sure, um, you know, either way, I think that, that people need to know what, what their cover is. Yeah. I wonder if you want to maybe address Amanda's question um, in the chat box. Um, I've been using Mirena for 20 years and no period, but do suspect going into more menopause. I also brushed it off. Um, as a stressful laugh, maybe even flu. Um, so really irritated with what's going on with me. I wondered if you yeah, could comment so on that. That's a great question. In terms of um, in, in any woman who um, hasn't for, got their period for whatever reason, she's had an early hysterectomy, um, she's on the Mirena, um, which obviously normally um, stops um, the, the period from happening, or they've had a uterine ablation, so they don't bleed. Um, and so we don't have the period as a sort of an obvious sign that something's changing from the perspective of an irregular period or a heavier period or something changing. But for sure, if there's any associated symptomatology, sort of from your early 40s, um, I would check in with a menopause specialist um, and and look into whether or not this could potentially be hormones. Um, and in some cases, do a trial of hormones to see whether or not um, it changes your symptomatology because that'll be your answer. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think, ladies, I gather we have answered most of the questions in the chat box and uh, we could probably close off. Um, thank you so much to the both of you for joining me today. Um, 
May you have a wonderful Tuesday going further to everybody on the chat. Have a great Tuesday and we'll see you next month. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you for so having much. us. Hmm.